welcome. Okay, good morning and welcome to the second meeting of the Writers to the Signet Dependents Annuity Fund Amendment Scotland Bill Committee. Can I remind all those present, including members, that mobile phones must be turned off? Today we are taking evidence from the promoters of the bill, the trustees of the Writers to the Signet Dependents Annuity Fund, and I would like to welcome Caroline Doherty, WS, Deputy Keeper of the Signet and Chairman of the Trustees for the Writers to the Signet Dependents Annuity Fund. Simon A. McIntosh, WS, Collector for the Writers to the Signet Dependents Annuity Fund, and Christine O'Neill, Partner of Brodie's LLP. Ms Doherty, I understand you have a short opening statement to make on behalf of the promoters. Uh, thank you very much, um, and, and thank you for the opportunity to, um, uh, to, to allow us to answer questions at any points which the committee um, has about the bill. Um, I appreciate that you've received briefing um, information, but I thought it would be helpful if I was to add some explanation as to who we are, as in um, who, the organisations we represent. Um, as you've mentioned, um, I'm Caroline Doherty, I'm Deputy Keeper to the Signet. That means that I'm, I'm effectively the president of the society known as the Society of Writers to Her Majesty's Signet, uh, known as the WS Society. In that capacity, I chair the Board of Trustees of the WS Dependents Annuity Fund, as you've mentioned, and Simon McIntosh um, is collector, in other words, administrator of that fund. So first, what is our writer to the Signet? Um, originally, writers to the Signet were exactly that. They were uh, those who were able to write and were particularly trusted and undertook work on behalf of the Crown. Um, the first recorded use of the signet, in other words, the seal of the king, was in 1369. Um, and in 1532, when James V established the system that we know today um, and the Court of Session came into being, writers to the signet were included as members of the College of Justice. Um, eventually, those trusted clerks became what are now solicitors, and the WS Society is the professional body for writers to the signet. In fact, we are probably the oldest professional body in the world, which is quite a distinction for a small, um, relatively small group of Scottish lawyers. So, but what is the relevance of this history today? Um, with the introduction of the Law Society uh, of Scotland in 1949, the regulatory role that the WS Society had ceased um, we had to develop our modern purposes, ensuring that the society has relevance um, that will allow us to continue into the future um, by being of interest to young lawyers. Um, and I believe we've been successful in doing that. Um, the WS Society continues to grow. We're now a society of around 1,000 lawyers. Um, over 100 new writers to the Signet have been welcomed in the last three years. They reflect the makeup of the solicitor profession in Scotland now uh, more generally in terms of gender and ethnic background. The society now includes student members, affiliate members, um, as well as writers to the signet, and therefore includes all age ranges from law students uh, to our most senior retired member, who's over 100 years old. So what does the society do? Uh, we provide legal training, uh, support in the form of library services, uh, both electronically and traditional paper format. We also provide research and drafting services for our members and our um, other lawyers and charitable trust administration. The Society owns the iconic Signet Library on Parliament Square and maintenance of that building and its historic and valuable treasures has become an important part of our purposes. In recent years, we've opened up the building more generally to the public. Colonnades there is an award-winning destination for afternoon tea, and we're building a series of cultural events open to the public, uh, lectures, discussions, exhibitions, performances called New Enlightenment. All of this combined with the history I've referred to, the fact that becoming a WS still requires taking an oath before an officer of state, the keeper um, of the signet, currently Lord Mackay of Clash Fern, that makes the society attractive to some lawyers, um, those who are interested in what we represent and the focus on high standards in legal, legal services, which um, we promote through our purposes. So finally, I've explained um, what writers to the Signet and the WS Society are. So that then brings me briefly to the separate and distinct body which is the subject of this bill, the WS Dependents Annuity Fund. Historically, the WS Society looked after writers to the Signet and their widows um, who might have fallen on ha um, hard times by ad hoc charitable uh, donations. In 1803, this was formalised when the original WS Widows Fund was started up. All WS at that time, of course, were men. 
This was to provide benefits to the widows of deceased writers to the signet. Over the years, the fund was changed so that it was widened to provide support for orphans and other dependents as well. And then later to take account of the fact that women were becoming writers to the signet um, from 1976. And then more recently to provide benefits uh, for the civil partners of deceased contributors to the fund. Until 1989, membership of the WS Society brought with it membership of the Dependents Annuity Fund, and it was seen as one of the benefits of being a writer to the Signet that you contributed to this fund. However, in 1989, in large part due to changes in the tax regime, which meant that the fund would become a less attractive proposition for new members contributing to it, uh, the fund was closed um, to new members at that point. Since that date, membership of the WS Society has continued to grow, as I've mentioned, but those who um, have become WS since that date are not contributors to the fund. Equally, not all of the contributors remain writers to the signet. Some have resigned their commission. So the two bodies um, are separate in that respect. But clearly, um, while the Society's membership is growing, the contributors to the fund are inevitably ageing. There are now no contributors to the fund who are younger than their early 50s, and the oldest is over 100. The trustees' aim is to ensure that the funds held by the Dependents Annuity Fund are administered in such a way that annuities, annual payments, will continue to be made to the widows and widowers of the contributors to the fund until uh, the death of the last of them. And that has to be done in a way that represents fairness between the generations. In other words, so that the last surviving widows or widowers don't receive a disproportionate payment. That's an explanation which I hope has been helpful um, in providing some background, and obviously we're happy to, to answer questions. Well, th thank you. If I could now move on to questions, could I would like to just say, you know, in addition to the 141 annuit annuitants, difficult word to say, how many potential annuitants are there? Have you a rough idea? There, there are at present 538 contributors. Most of those will have a surviving spouse, but not all of them. So there are over 500 potential annuitants. OK, thank you. How long is it estimated the fund will pay annuities? In a way, the, um, the life of the fund depends on the life of contributors mm. and, and when the last contributor dies, leaving a surviving spouse. Um, so we have some projections from actuaries which suggest it could be well into the 2040s anyway. Okay. And, okay. and then when the last annuitant is identified, it's a question of how long he or she survives their, their spouse. And what would happen if any residual monies in the fund after all the, the um, dependents have died? What, what would happen then? Um, well, I, I, I think that um, due to the purpose that I, or, or the aim rather, that I mentioned that the fund has, um, that that won't happen. Um, so that the trustees will have to find a strategy that, that, that as I say, that means that that won't happen. Um, so the most likely end game for the fund, I suppose, is that at some point in the future. Um, uh, a, a product will be bought from an insurance company using the remaining funds. It's putting it simplistically, but you know um, that that would then provide annuities for the remaining uh, annuitants to avoid what you've just described. Okay, thank you. Could I now ask Tom to come in? Have you some questions? Thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. I just wondered if you could perhaps expand and um, and unpack some of the reasons for the decision to close the fund. Um, to new contributors in 1989? Um, I, th I think uh, none of us were directly involved at, 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 at that point, but um, as Caroline Doherty has said, there were changes to the tax regime mm. in 1988 relating particularly to um, the taxation of personal pensions mm. and the introduction of, of the new personal pensions regime, which made um, for anybody new joining the scheme, it's rather less attractive to, to save in this way. And um, the then contributors decided to, to close the fund to, to new contributors at that point. But 
as I understand it, it was to do with changes to the tax regime under the 1988 Income and Corporation Taxes Act. Okay. Okay. Any further questions you want to ask at this stage? You want to you could ask Mary Fee to come in? Please. Thank you and, and good morning. I, I wanted to ask for a bit more information about the, the definition of an actuary. Um, because Section 1 1 of the Bill would modernise the definition of an actuary. Um, now, an, an actuary is a fellow of the Faculty of Actuaries in Scotland or a fellow of the Institute of Actuaries. Now, I understand those two organisations merged in, in, in 2011 and, and this is um, reflected in the proposed definition. But I just I wonder if you could um, explain in a bit more detail whether the existing definition has caused any difficulty since those two organisations merged and if any um, views have been sought from either the Institute or the Faculty on, on your proposals. I think it's fair to say that there have been no difficulties and it's more um, from our, on our part a tidying up exercise, okay. recognising that that um, change that you've mentioned mm -hmm. has taken place. Um, we, we wanted to tidy up the wording. To, to reflect that new organisation, oh. rather than it being because of any difficulties. Okay. Just, just to add to that, my, my advice to the promoters would be that as a matter of law, the change to the definition wouldn't be required and that if there was ever any difficulty around the existing definition, a court would um, interpret it to include the new definition post-merger, so the co a court would take a pragmatic and sensible approach to the old definition, but as um, Caroline has indicated, it, it's a, a tidying up exercise. I should say that I have spoken informally to the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries about uh, the change, and in due course, um, if this uh, bill proceeds to the next stage, uh, they have suggested they might um, wish to see a, a further um, additional concept of something that would be called a fellow of the um, Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, which will be their new title going forward, and therefore there would be a further degree of future proofing um, achieved by the Bill. So anything that was changed in this Bill would, would completely match whatever the, the Faculty and That's Institute the decide to do? Yes. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, in general terms, I would like to ask whether the role and function of the collector, I mean, what happens with that and how onerous is it? Right. Um, <laughs> Please shall I start on describe that. Describe your own role. Well, as, as collector, it's, um, I, I, as Caroline said in her introduction, I'm the administrator of the fund, so that involves liaising closely with the deputy keeper as, as chair of the trustees and with the six other trustees. Um, I have to um, maintain good relationships with the collectors and annuitants um, through regular communications with them and dealing with their phone calls and, and emails. Um, more specifically, in dealing with the contributors, I need to collect their annual contributions um, I have to keep them informed about developments in the fund, for example, um, the latest actuarial report, which we had a couple of years ago, and meetings to do with that. Um, I have to give them notice of the annual general meeting and any other general meetings they are invited to, and any informal consultations which the trustees are carrying out. And I have to deal with their general inquiries and get notification from them of deaths and marriages, for example. Um, so that's really dealing with the contributors. And on the annuitant side, twice a year, um, I pay out the annuity to them, and I get their correspondence. Or if an annuitant dies, I hear from their family, and, and the annuity comes to an end. And broadly keep them informed of any developments to do with the fund as well. So that's the sort of external side of it. Um, internally, um, I, I keep the fund records. Um, I deal with the banking arrangements. We collect income from the fund managers to, to fund the annuity payments. Um, we prepare the accounts. Uh, we, within my office, we prepare the accounts for the fund each year, um, have them audited, have them approved by the trustees and sent to the contributors. Um, we also deal with the tax compliance, so UK tax compliance, and we also um, seek tax repayments from, from other countries under double tax treaty arrangements. Um, 
and so that's the, the compliance side. And then um, we're also dealing with the fund managers and receiving reports from the, them of their transactions, which go into our records for the accounts. Um, we deal with the actuary um, and get their advice and distribute that to the trustees. Um, and we're dealing with the auditor of the fund as well, um, so that we we deal in the normal way with any audit queries they have and have the accounts finalised, um, and deal with Data Protection Act registration for the fund, and deal with the trustees' meetings, so arrange them, prepare the papers for them, prepare the minutes, and deal with follow-up and so on. So it's a it's a very broad administration function for for the fund. Okay, thank you. Tom Arthur, would you like to come in at this stage? Thank you, convener. I think this brings us nicely to the substantive um, element of the bill, which is the, the role of the collector, essentially, um, or who a collector can be. Um, just let me begin by asking, I made reference to, obviously, the changes that occurred in, in 1989. Um, regarding some of the consequences that would follow with that, the uh, diminishing pool of uh, contributors, um, were any, I appreciate obviously you weren't perhaps not there at the time, but were there any um, effects and potentialities anticipated at that time as regards to um, who could possibly be a collector in the future as a consequence of a diminishing pool? No, I, mean, I think it's I think it's clear that that consideration wasn't given to it at that time. It was just something that I suppose in 1989, um, it, it simply. You know, it, it seems, uh, if it was thought about at all, it seemed so far in the future that um, it, it's... A simple every active element to the changes that occurred in 1988. Yes, and Addressing yes. an immediate concern as opposed to future-proofing as this bill seeks to do. Absolutely. I think yeah. that's true. And I think, and, and in terms of the, 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 the journey um, towards introducing this bill, um, was consideration given to um, any other courses of action such as reopening the fund or such like? Um, no, I mean, I think that... Um, or even changing the eligibility criteria. I think it's very much a case that um, we've always... Uh, we look on, the, you know, the, the fund is... The, we are where we are. Mm -hmm. And and um, you know, leaving aside reasons as to why it would remain not tax efficient mm -hmm. to open it up, uh, we, we've always taken the view that um, the fund is as, is as it is. There's no push for any, um, uh, you know, any other strategy for it, um, and so there is no other alternative, given that the current Act says that the collector has to be a writer to the signet, then the only alternative, given what I've explained about the ages, um, is that we, um, that we remove the requirement. Um, so finally, I'm just I'm very conscious of the of your rich and long-standing traditions um, and heritage. Uh, just I notice at the end of it, the collector still has to be an individual and not a company of an organisation. Is that what was the reasoning behind that decision? I, I, I think again because, um, and by the way, this came out of um, um, uh, feedback that we sought from the current contributors, and they felt that um, the fund um, is 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 unique, um, and that that as such because of its origins, they would like to feel that there was always a person responsible rather than um, you know, a, an organisation being appointed. They, they, they felt that it was important that that aspect be continued, that, that there was an element of personal um, uh, responsibility. They like this feeling that they've always had, which is that there's one person, they know who it is, that they can phone if they feel they need to. That would I find that interesting because of the, the decision to close in the 19th was very much based upon efficiencies around tax, etc. This decision is made in perhaps more um, subjective, if I could say, any motive reasons. But no, I appreciate that. If I could just add one point about 1989 and the change that was made and providing for the change that's now being anticipated. I think one distinction just to be aware of is that the closing of the fund was something that was open to the trustees at that time to do in terms of the regulations that they're allowed to make. 
um, under the current Act, so it was something that was wholly within the control of the trustees. Had they wanted at that stage to make the change that's now being sought, legislation would have been required, so there would have been an extra step. So it, it wouldn't have been um, it wouldn't have been something they could have done in quite the same way as the closing of the fund was done. Mm. Just one, just for just in reflection, and a question to, to Simon McIntosh, given the sort of the, I suppose, the, the, the range of um, obligations you have within the role, would, would you, of your opinion, would um, a professional organisation, would that provide greater flexibility and greater support, you think, than one individual could within the role of collector? Or do you think the role of collector is one that can be um, uh, carried out to its um, required sort of level by an individual? Um, I personally don't do all of those things myself, for example, the, the preparation of the accounts, for example, I rely on professional colleagues within my firm to do that. Um, and, but just the, the, collect, the contributors were quite clear they did want to have an individual there, uh, although they recognised that a number of the functions required the support of a professional firm or professional organisation. Um, and they, they wish to continue with an individual overall responsible to them as contributors and to the annuitants for the, the running of the fund. Um, but they recognise and expect that there will be professional backup. Um, and indeed, my, my predecessor, um, and in fact, all my predecessors have been solicitors in private practice um, with the backup of, a, of, a of, of their firm behind them. All my predecessors I can think of, I'm sure. Yes, in living memory. <laughs> in living, me in living memory. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it might be worth just um, making a supplementary point about um, late 1980s, early 1990s. In 1994, the actuarial report shows there were over 800 contributors. Um, and at that point, 20 plus years ago, they would not have been thinking about running out of potential collectors on that sort of number of, of contributors. Um, and in the mid 1990s, the trustees did commission a report from their then actuaries about various measure, various possibilities, including potentially opening of the fund to reopening of the fund to new entrants, and they were advised very firmly against that. And they were also advised against merging with another fund or winding up in the near future. And the decision taken then, based on this advice, was to continue. And they thought for 20 plus years, and we're now roughly at the 20 plus year point. And, and the, the eventual wind up date, <coughs> excuse me, is rather further out than they thought in the mid 1990s. But uh, those possibilities were canvassed at that point. Okay, thank you. Could I bring in Mary Fee at this thank stage? Thank you. Can I just ask um, a, a brief follow-up question from the answer that you gave my, my colleague, um, Tom Arthur? When you said um, they were advised against opening up or merging, was there a specific or particular reason or set of reasons why that advice was given? Um, <clears throat> I, can, I can read from the report that the trustees received from Watson Wyatt in July 1996. Um, and on the first possibility of reopening the fund to new entrants, they, they advised against for the following principal reasons. First of all, that new entrants would have to go into part two of the fund, which would be a tax inefficient way of saving. And it's difficult to see what could be provided through the fund that could not as easily and probably more cheaply be provided through the mechanism of personal pensions. Um, and secondly, that contributions would need to rise substantially if the existing fund wasn't to subsidise such new contributors. And on merger, um, they said that um, it would be difficult to see why the trustees or managers of another fund would be prepared to merge with this fund, i.e. the WS fund, without extracting a significant price in the form of, of a share of surplus. Very helpful, thank you. Thank you. Well, out of interest, in relation to the election and oversight of the collector. Has any thought been given to the updating the regulations following the passage of the bill? Um, yes, we, we've considered updating the regulations. It is something we have done um, relatively recently. Um, and I think inevitably there is a possibility that 
uh, we will need to to update the regulations. That's something obviously we can do within the within the the regular programme of meetings um, and the annual general meeting of the contributors and so on. So yes, if there's need to do that, we we would yeah. Okay, I'm going to go back now to Mary Fee. Th thank you. Um, Sorry, we're back with the forwards. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can, can I just um, continue on the point of the diminishing pool of um, contributors? Because it's my understanding the collector and the elected trustees must be contributors, and they must be elected by the fund's contributors. So as that pool diminishes, how, how will that be done? Because I suppose eventually you'll get to a point there'll be what, a handful of people or potentially no one. So how will that, so, sorry, how will that be managed? Um, it's, it's not the case that the trustees have to be contributors. Um, so we have, um, until recently, we, we, as a matter of policy, all of the trustees were contributors, but we now have one trustee who's not, who is not, and okay. he has a particular area of expertise that we wanted to uh, rely on. He's a solicitor and he's a writer to the signet. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the trustees will be able to continue um, um, b because there isn't that requirement that they be uh, contributors. The issue arises only in relation to the collector. The collector, okay, that, that, that's been helpful. But the, the, con the contributors elect a collector or a trustee. What will happen if you get to the point where there are no contributors? Um, when there are no contributors, we're into the territory then of um, what I had mentioned before. Mm -hmm. At that point, um, some strategy. At, at the moment, we assume, but, but who knows what might happen in intervening years in terms of products that are available, but at the moment we assume that um, annuities will have been bought for the future annuitants. So the products will be there in place to pay out, but there will be no need necessarily for the body of trustees. Mm -hmm. So we... The trustees are responsible for ensuring that um, the purpose uh, of, of paying annuities to mm -hmm. all potential annuitants is continued, and as I say, um, they will um, ensure that there's a strategy, and, and that would probably be buying a product to ensure that happens. To ensure that happens, because you spoke earlier on about future proofing and making sure the the, the, the bill future proofed everything. So I, I presume at some point um, you, you would be looking for, say, five years ahead, ten. You would plan so that you would know as the pool diminished, you would you would have to to, to make alternative arrangements. Exactly, and that's something within the control of the, the trustees themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the body of trustees is always very conscious that at any point it's looking five years, as you say, ten years. Mm -hmm and longer ahead um, and looking at the various possible um, options for for the fund. Okay, that's helpful, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay, well, I appreciate this is already stated in the promoter's memorandum, but just so that we have it on record, could you please give me your reasons why the legislation is required to achieve the bill's two objectives? Uh, yes, um, so the, the legislation is um, required to achieve the objectives because there is no other means by which the requirement that the collector be a contributor can be um, altered. It, it requires an amendment to effectively primary legislation. Okay, thank you. And I would just finally like to ask you, were there any opposing views um, voiced by the contributors at the AGM? Uh, but the proposal to remove yes. that requirement? Yes. No, there were no opposing views. Okay. That's lovely. Thank you. I don't know. Any further questions? No. 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 Well, I would just like to thank you for coming along today and answering <laughs> the questions so efficiently. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so if we would just like to now move the session into private. Thank you.